So, let's start this time. Hi, uh, my name is Igars, and I'll be trying to answer a very, very important question for us today. Will there be a Debian in your next BMW car? Spoilers? No. <laughs> But I will try to tell you what will be and why and how that whole thing comes together uh, from the perspective of a person who am I. Uh, so I've been a Debian developer since the year 2000 and uh, now I'm actually closer to 12 years of developing exclusively in Python. Uh, I've uh, worked for Nokia to help them um, when, when it was still good, and uh, help them create uh, conf uh, configuration systems for like, oh, we'll do lots of stuff, uh, a lot of different phones. I worked for BBC to uh, help them create the UU setup box and actually test that. And then at, uh, at uh, DevCon 15, uh, BMW was sponsoring that, that event, and they had a job, for, uh, job fair and they were selling like, well, we kind of need people with the experience in Linux systems, with a lot of Python knowledge, and who know how embedded software works and how to test embedded devices. And I was like, you've just described my entire CV. <laughs> <laughs> so, soon after that, I uh, talked to them more and joined BMW Car IT and moved to Ulm in Germ southern Germany. I did not have any auto-specific knowledge before that, so basically this presentation is the story about all the interesting and non-confidential things that I have discovered since then and thought all of you might be interested in. So in theory, a car is an extremely simple thing. It's just like some frames, a couple of wheels, preferably four, a steering wheel, like some engine, something, mm -hmm. seats, maybe radio. That's it. What could be really complex? What could be software about the, about the car? But if we take a take a look just from the driver's seat of a modern car, we start to notice screens everywhere. You can see, <coughs> not even highlighted, in the very middle there is a, 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 the head unit. That's the part where uh, the maps and navigation show up. There's a heads-up display. There is an instrument cluster. There is now even displays for the climate control system. And a display on your key as well. That's just the ones you're visible right now. And that is just the very, very edge, just the top of the iceberg, because behind each of those, there is a computer. And behind that computer, there are multiple networks that connect them together. So, in practice, modern cars are extremely complex and advanced network systems. In a modern car, this is an old slide. This is a couple years ago. It has become even worse than that. In a modern car, you can find up to 80 electronic control units, basically computers that are connected by up to eight different types of networks. <laughs> and some of them are more generic, uh, not, not really specific uh, hardware controllers. Some are uh, more generic, almost normal computers that mostly communicate over Ethernet. But others are tiny, 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 real-time components with uh, code baked into the chip itself and they communicate with others over hard real-time networks, like FlexRay or something even less comprehensible than that. We have uh, a lot of uh, specialization, a lot of different components, and uh, even automakers recognize that this, this kind of stuff is kind of unsustainable if you make it box by box. So uh, they've started several years ago to standardize on high-level architectures of how the code would be built, what would be the buses. So uh, a lot of what is in the car is the same across 
almost all the manufacturers. So that is getting a bit better over time. But then we hit the future, and the future is bright. In the future, the computational and functional demands on the computers in the cars and the cars themselves will only rise. We'll need more computing power and more computers to do that uh, kind of computations. So we can see that, uh, with, especially with autonomous driving, it's not just the computers that do the autonomous driving that will be there, it's the computers that will entertain the passengers while the car is driving themselves. And yeah. With, with the more and more computing power required, car manufacturers are starting to consider that having 80 computers, or now 150 computers, in a car might be a bit too much. And instead, uh, there are ideas about consolidating uh, many of those uh, small, hard, real-time computers into larger computers, which are more generic. So instead of tiny boxes running uh, assembler instructions, you would uh, have one high, uh, larger box that is running a normal Linux operating system with a bunch of applications on it. That is the direction that these, these uh, boxing things are just going now, right now. Uh, but for us, at this point, at this point in time in, in, a computer, uh, in, a, in a computer and car industry, what we would like to look at more uh, from the Debian perspective, from Linux perspective, is the few computers in current cars that look very much like normal computers that we're interested in. And that's basically the uh, head unit display and in some higher uh, level models, the rear seat entertainment. Uh, clusters uh, that yeah, entertain the passengers in the back. Uh, these are basically almost like normal computers. They have Ethernet, they have Bluetooth, they have SSDs and hard drives, they have USB connections. Those don't look anywhere near normal USB cables. They're round and weird, but they're secured uh, uh, against interference mostly. And uh, the hardware design in large, uh, broad strokes is similar to what we see in phones. So you can, you have a, you have a, uh, basically a motherboard with everything baked in. And that goes through several iterations until it gets to something that can be actually released. Uh, but there are different requirements. So yeah, the computer in a car will need to work for several decades. It will need to to tolerate extreme vibrations. It will need to, to tolerate a lot of dust, possibly even oil getting onto it, and all kinds of weird conditions that, in a fo phone world, is perfectly fine for the phone to actually break if you drop it on the concrete, but not in the car world. And. Functionally, some of those parts are very close to what, what we can get on the phone. So you, you have like navigation, you have like media playback, internet, you get some system settings, in this case the car settings, uh, information, and even uh, you get some applications installed onto those systems. And yet these systems are uh, trying to differentiate themselves from the phones by being tightly coupled to the car. So they have access to things, to the sensors that uh, phones do not have. Like for example, uh, wheel rotation sensors. So in a tunnel, when your GPS loses signal, uh, in-car navigation can continue to show you precise location when you are, based on the wheel rotation and the, uh, where your steering wheel is pointing to, which a phone you cannot quite do. Uh, and a computer in a car can interact with the car suspension, for example. Sometimes that's not a good thing, but, uh, but it can be useful. Or it can uh, show you a surround picture of what is happening around your car from parking sensors. Pretty useful when you try to park it. Or when you've left the car behind and you want to see if somebody is approaching your car. 
If we go deeper, there is a lot of stuff going on in there. Just don't try to read that. <laughs> it's just an illustration that there's a lot of layers and a lot of uh, a lot of libraries, a lot of things that are being done inside. Even just uh, the one the one uh, uh, electronic computer control unit that uh, controls the the head unit, the navigation cluster. Uh, in total, uh, when we build the software, we can get up to 9,000 individual packages just in that one uh, system. Uh, if we're going from the top down, so there is uh, the uh, Genevi is uh, like a, a generic uh, uh, collaboration between the car, car manufacturers to create. Um, in vehicle uh, entertainment uh, uh, or information systems, it has uh, ways uh, and APIs to uh, allow communication be uh, between uh, between software, whether it's on the same uh, computer or on different computers, so remote access calls through the common API and some IP. Uh, then we go, we use Yocto. So we use the open embedded framework and the bitbake tools to actually compile the software that we're uh, delivering. Other, underneath all that, so we control everything with Git, we build everything with Jenkins, and we review every code with, with Garrett. So that's already getting closer to what we're getting used to. And there are components that are relatively new that we now know will be in the next cars. So I'm happy to say uh, that we will be shipping systems with System D and Wayland uh, for the next cars. Uh, so that is kind of a future that is coming to life, uh, even if uh, our desktop systems are not quite ready for that. But we are. We are more. Uh, we, are, we can we can control the environment, so we can actually have all the applications written in Wayland from scratch. So we don't have the problems of backwards compatibility with that. So the good stuff from this this uh, whole approach of uh, building the source packages, uh, building the, the from the source. Uh, so uh, you've you've seen in previous talks here uh, what Bitbake kind of is look li looks like. So the big bit in Bitbake files we basically declare like okay to get libgtk we want to go to that Git repository we want to check out this particular Git revision then we want to apply these patches and then we want to compile it with these options and so we can customize uh, everything uh, on that uh, on that on that uh, stack we can com customize all the bit option, build options we can apply whatever patches we, we really require <coughs> and all the contents of the images that we have are controlled uh, from uh, our git repository from so these bitbake files in git repository fully uh, control what will end up in the end, uh, end image. So there is no change uh, somewhere upstream that would uh, in any way influence uh, the end image on our side. <coughs> we have to build a lot of images, so there's a diff different targets. We need to build SDKs and we need to also build packages uh, that developers could install to bring extra functionality for, for the for the software, so in in time of development, for example. Um, it's a uh, it's a big process. So uh, when we build the whole system from scratch, it can take more than eight hours to fully compile the system. But incremental builds are definitely much 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 faster because everything is cached. Uh, one thing I wanted also to touch is uh, licensing requirements. So in this space, the licensing requirements are taken extremely seriously. So um, every bit build 
when it identifies that the license is uh, one of the list of li licenses that require uh, software distribution, uh, uh, there is an additional uh, build artifact created which contains all the sources of all, for example, GPL uh, uh, packages that uh, go into this, this particular build. And that is happening for every build, including just developer builds that are happening several hundred times a day. So that's a, that's a good practice that, so that we have this, this source all the time and we make sure that it uh, appears. And if there is some package that tries to include something uh, and doesn't declare, declare a license specifically, it will be blocked from execution. It will not pass into the software. So every piece of software that goes in must declare a license and uh, license requirements are taken seriously by the tools automatically. So we don't have to worry about that later on. Uh, and of course we we actually cross-compile everything. So that's, uh, that's it's a good practice uh, whether whether your target environment is the same as your base environment or, or not, we just use cross-compilation the whole time. What is not so good uh, in, this, uh, in this process of having everything through BitBake? We kind of need uh, a lot of base packages, so a lot of software that uh, we have minimal changes or almost no changes from what, what the upstream or Debian ships, but they still need to be maintained. Because we kind of want to be very specific about, okay, we want this particular git comment of the software to be in our systems. And unless we say, unless we update that particular hash, nothing will change. Uh, by being this specific, we have the power, but we also have the responsibility of maintaining these these uh, versions, which basically leads to the situations where they get frozen at some point. And then the security team needs to be. Uh, internal security team needs to go and s search for uh, whatever security vulnerabilities are happening and track that down. Uh, in some cases, uh, things like runtime dependencies can uh, trigger massive rebuilds of the whole thing. So at one point we updated a system D. Mm -hmm. And because everything depends on system D to get their services running, everything got rebuilt. That was not fun. Uh, anything that uh, a developer needs, uh, either either during development or during a test, needs to be included in this uh, hierarchy of packages into the SDK. That means that the SDK that we are giving to the rest of the developers uh, can grow really, really big, very, very fast. So it, it can exceed several gigabytes of uh, the SDK package. And that is a problem that is hard to, uh, pretty hard to manage. And we'll try to limit the dependencies that developers are trying to bring in. Uh, when you have several hundred uh, builds happening every day, you probably will not do them on the same server. And when you have multiple servers and you are trying to cache intermediate compilation results, the cache management starts to become extremely tricky, how it happens. And yeah, the caching, the caches are in tens of gigabytes and they need to be synchronized and yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. Uh, at this point, the builds that we are having are not reproducible. There's bunch of stuff that we're doing that is bad and should change and that is that was one one of the goals that uh, my, my employees sent me here hey find out everything about reproducible builds <laughs> because uh, for example it would be nice to figure out if we have a car we have a car that was in an accident especially if it was a, a autonomous driving accident we kind of need to be able to verify what binaries it was running. 
what was the source of those binaries, what were the compile options that were produced them. We need to actually verify that, sometimes in court. And that is, that is important. The other thing that is of more immediate importance is updates. So we compile the whole system from scratch. And if we then do an update of one particular function somewhere in navigation, it would be nice if only the navigation binary changed. Both from an auditing perspective, like, okay, this changed, this didn't, that's fine. But also from the update, uh, incremental updates perspective. So the update is much smaller. And that, uh, that goes into not just reproducible <coughs> builds as a whole, but okay, can we do something about having the, the uh, locality of the changes inside the 200 megabytes binary? It's another tr a problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, Bitbag has interesting connotations. For example, uh, when you try to run a big project with 8, 9, 10,000 Bitbag tasks, uh, well, each of those tasks has subtasks like do fetch, do configure, do compile, do install. The problem is the Bitbag sometimes really, really eagerly schedules the same type of tasks simultaneously. So you have 16 threads running, but all of them are stuck on do fetch. <laughs> they are all downloading source code from somewhere. And when they've done that, they all execute do compile. And some of those compilers, they take more memory than the system would have if all of them are running in parallel. Yeah, we have some crashes. Uh, Bitbank is also extremely prone to escalating complexity. Because basically every layer, every file in Bitbank could modify anything else. It could layer on top, below, in, in the middle of any other process or layer or anything. It is super useful. For example, we have the security team uh, specifying compile options for the whole project in one file. Super cool. Except then other developers would kind of need to understand the rest, the whole of the project to really know what uh, options are used when compiling their software. So the com complexity can really escalate without organizational uh, uh, solutions for that. So, where is Debian in the whole of this? At this point, yeah, not so much. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, a, an initial build environment that is used to like compile GCC and libc for the start of this whole process. And that is, well, currently it's actually bootstrapped from Ubuntu, but it will be bootstrapped from Debian soon. Uh, but there are other things that could be done that I could see from from the, from the inside and from Debian perspective that could be uh, done to bring these worlds closer together. Uh, for example, there's a lot of auto-specific tools that are kind of not really auto-specific. So the, the tools for uh, managing the logging from embedded devices, so, you, so uh, a DLT is a log uh, Log, uh, kind of a log, log, binary log format for outputting information out of a, a device that doesn't have enough storage to write its own logs locally. And uh, that kind of thing and other, other tools and libraries could be uh, packaged for general uh, Debian consumption and then maybe propagate to other embedded areas. Uh, as I said, we really, really love reproducible builds. Having them perfect and having the documentation about how other developers in their own projects can do reproducibility of builds, uh, especially with like language-specific blocks like, okay, if you're doing it in C, go through this list, 
do these options, do not do these options, definitely, uh, that will be a big help, uh, not just to us, but to other communities as well. Uh, there are tools that we're using, that are libraries that we're using, that uh, by improving them, yeah, you're basically helping improve the software that will be going into cars and other devices eventually as well. And uh, uh, currently, a lot of the packages that we're using in the cars, uh, we are we're not checking out anything, the source from Debian. We're checking out the source from upstream Git repositories. So, the more so, uh, code, the more fixes go upstream, uh, the better it would be to, to developers that do the, the same kind of thing. Uh, there are some, some uh, things that uh, also were a problem, like The bootstrap, well, we really like to use the bootstrap more, except well, we were faced with GPL compliance issue, because when we generate an image with the bootstrap, we don't get a tarball of sources next to it. And that would be very, very useful. <laughs> To, because that, that's the way how, how a company of white policy would set that, yeah, the easiest way to, to comply with GPL is just, just ship the sources right next to the binaries. And we don't get that from the bootstrap. It's pretty annoying. And so we, we will probably be trying to, to do that kind of thing as a, as, a, as a feature, but if somebody beats us to it, that would be amazing. And uh, um, one other thing that has been has also come up in this morning's talk was that okay, Bitbake basically is a thing in embedded community. So it would be nice if we had an easier way to use uh, Debian source packages, Debian binary packages from a Bitbake recipe. So I would probably want to say okay, <coughs> I want to get this particular Debian package with its uh, from source or from, from a binary. And if it's from source, I want to like add this particular patch on top of that and uh, have that as an easier way to reuse the work that is already in Debian to, uh, to targets that are created by Bitbag. Uh, but in general, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is easier to get these whole things together if there are more developers with our mindset inside those teams. So, yeah, there's a link. Thank you. And questions? Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, I'd like to know if you'll be backporting all this cool stuff to my uh, 2011 335D, but uh, the answer is probably not. Uh, my real question is, um, and I'm sorry you weren't able to be at my uh, compliance talk, because there's a commonly overlooked other uh, prong in the fork of um, what the GPL requires, and that is the installability of modified versions of the code. Um, Doing source code disclosure is critical, and uh, it's, it's wonderful that you guys are doing that. Um, when I was at Cisco, we, we spent a lot of effort trying to make sure our engineering teams would actually comply with that, um, and it's all too rare. But there is that other aspect, even of GPL v2, that says the, the end result needs to be um, installable. And GPL v3 requires this too. I think a car qualifies as a consumer device, uh, at least. Um, for things that are commercial fleets? Uh, yes, uh, due to this reason, the software that is GPL uh, is actually not allowed to be on the car. So uh, there are tools that are packaged in the whole framework, but they are in the SDK, so that's the same thing that is not shipped with the car. And therefore, this thing kind of gets works around. 
uh, why we actually uh, care about this compliance at all with this concept? Because the SDK and the other development things get distributed to other companies. And uh, that's, that is where the, the, the legal, legal problems start. So there's no copy left at all that's in the devices on the car? No. Wow, okay. That's, that's too bad. I was really opening for an angle there. <laughs> Yeah, there is a legal team that is working on that. And yeah. So, so just to clarify, that the the Linux kernel does not appear in the car at all anywhere. Um, the, the Linux, Linux kernel doesn't have its license enforced, so it's okay. <laughs> busy box. Anyway, that may be something to consider for for the installation instructions. I think. Um, <coughs> with the, the bit big part, have you actually thought about doing these as individual packages and actually patching the packages and using the Debian build tools and then using archives and things like that to actually do the, the build? The problem tool. is uh, that this whole uh, <coughs> process uh, needs to work on hundreds of different machines, completely independent from each other. So yeah, uh, that's, we that's have that's developers. The of, uh, dependencies and uh, configuration packages and things. Uh, we have developers that are building these things that are like completely remote uh, from from the systems that we have. So the thing is, they they need to build these images completely locally, and we have. Uh, a lot of build servers that are creating those local images without uh, without them publishing anything. So it, the versions that they are actually compiling are different. They have different batches installed. They have in progress the, the development. So I've uh, I've thought about this uh, when uh, when you pr proposed this in the morning, and um, I'm pretty sure it would be very hard to, uh, hard to work out because it would require uh, way more moving parts working together to get this uh, into a working order. But you would get reproducibility and you would get um, the sharing of the, of the, of the binaries rather than the rebuild of You wouldn't have the caching problems. We would still want to have the uh, like uh, developers and other teams uh, uh, rebuilding the, uh, the other binaries with their updated versions of libraries so that they could actually che yeah. check that maybe, stuff maybe works they automatically. In, maybe they only fill in 12 packages out of, out of a thousand. There is a, um, an idea to do that, uh, to have like a base layer mm -hmm. that is less changing. The problem is we also change the base layer quite a lot. So we change uh, even like we change compilation settings. Uh, in some cases, we in, uh, inject libraries that do uh, runtime audit of the binaries that are running on the system. So there's there's quite a lot of changes that are in the base layers, and they evolve over time as well. The other thing is that um, I have actually written some code which does the uh, obtaining of the source code packages, the DSCs and stuff, <coughs> after one in different strap. Um, it's relatively simple to actually go through if you've got, um, as you've got the, the sources file in the bootstrap at the end, then it's relatively easy to actually then tune it in, uh, change the, or add a dev source, and go through the package L and get the source in. Uh, that so that's one way around the bootstrap sourcing yeah. side of it. You get the, Debian, the full Debian copyright stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, it it would be better if we just have like an extra the bootstrap option, like oh, produce also a thing here that has all the sources. But uh, to get that, we could we could do this. It, it'll be the same code whether you do it as the bootstrap runs or straight mm -hmm. afterwards. It, you're not actually going to save any time yeah. by doing it doing the bootstrap because the bootstrap doesn't care about dev source normally. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're not actually going to be saving any time whether you do it doing or straight after. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can do it with that. So Toshiba is uh, building uh, Debian source packages using BitBake. Are you aware of this work? 
Um, I personally am definitely not aware of that and would, would like to look at uh, how, if that would be useful. Yep. Hi. Um, okay. So I would like a clarification on the whole like, is Linux actually running on the car thing? <laughs> and also, sort of, because my original question was, what happens if system D spikes and like the car freezes? Um, that is that a thing? Like, is system D running on the car? Uh, the the kernel and the system D are definitely running on the entertainment cluster of the car. Oh, okay. So it's not in the engine control unit, which actually <laughs> controls the, yeah, the, the, the actual running of the car. Uh, so worst case, uh, in the worst case scenario, even nowadays, uh, what happens is that uh, there are separate watch watchdogs that monitor the processes, the key processes, and if any of them uh, free stops responding, freezes, crashes, whatever happens, basically what happens is the system reboot. Uh, sometimes, uh, well, let's say that most of the time uh, we hope that users will not actually notice that because uh, it, it can take less than two seconds. But the, the, there's the like whole a Linux bit that's plugged with the, into whole, with the whole reinitialization of the UI right. to the same state of, oh, okay. as it was before. Well, that's handy. Um, but there, there is like a Linux bit that's plugged into like the sensors, like reads the sensor network or something? Uh, it reads the, the network, which includes the data from the sensors. Okay, cool, yeah. thank you. Okay, so you said that it reads the network. I wasn't here for the start of the talk. So does the Linux have access to the campus? Uh, yes, uh, yes, the li Linux has access to the campus. That sounds a bit dangerous. There are multiple CAN buses. <laughs> okay. It speaks only to the entertainment CAN bus, I guess, or...? Uh, yes. The, basically, um, there are up to eight different types of networks, and each of them has multiple instances. Most of them have multiple instances inside the car. So, you only have the buses that are required to, for, the, for the communications uh, that are uh, requested. And on top of that, there are also like firewall, firewall rules for many of those uh, networks, like uh, you might be able to communicate with the tire pressure sensors uh, from, from, the, from the entertainment cluster because you need to show the pressure uh, indicators. But there are some other data that you don't need, so that is actually blocked from them. And it's available through a different network to a different ECU. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I, uh, thanks for the talk. I just wanted to make a little comment. Um, earlier, this, earlier this week, I gave a talk about secure software updates, and uh, several people asked me why uh, New York University, who, who developed the framework, uh, hadn't talked about it earlier, and so I just wanted to drop another project that's actually a spin-off of this secure update framework. Uh, it's called Uptain, and it uh, is spe specifically designed for uh, updates in cars and for the uh, special requirements of the tiny ECU. So I don't know if you guys are already aware of the project, but um, it might be interesting, I guess. Um, let me say it this way, uh, there is a team that is uh, working on the remote updates and software updates in general and uh, they're a very isolated team for, for security purposes and uh, so, so I don't specifically know what they are using but uh, that is uh, an inf information that I would, I would definitely pass on to them, the, the concepts that might be useful would be nice to see. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.